Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Turner, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney magic, whether they be singers, actors, dancers, imagineers, animators, they all have made their mark on the Disney name. To find out more about the show and other episodes, head to our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. Be sure to look below at the show notes in the Show More section for links to our Twitter and Facebook pages, including videos and websites mentioned in the following interview. Photos and audio clips that are featured in the show belong to their rightful owners and are only used for educational purposes only. All guest opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or of the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thanks again for tuning in and have a hoopty doo day! Without further ado, today I'd like to welcome writer, director, and artist Jerry Rees to the Tierra Talk Show. Welcome, Jerry. Well, hello there. It's nice to be on your show. Oh, and you're the first. I, we were just discussing this right before we started recording. Right. You were the first interview for our YouTube channel. So. Ah, uh, that's such an get, honor. It's kind of like you're christening a cruise boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. I, I um, I'm, I'm honored that you chose me in this position. So. Oh. I, Here we go. Yes. So uh, <laughs> you have worked on several Disney projects over the years for the Disney Company, and today we're going to talk about your first project, was a, which was a short film called Back to Neverland, which premiered in Disney's MGM Studios at the uh, Animation Building Center. Um, so could you uh, give our audience who have never seen the film uh, a small summary of what the film was about and the topic it covered? Oh, gosh. It was... Um... It, it was basically just supposed to explain to people uh, how we approach animation at Disney, like what, what, what the Disney animation tradition was all about. And uh, so there's sort of two tracks. It had started on a track of being a, a technical explanation, like how many drawings per second and here's how you do um, cell painting and, you know, just the process analysis and um, – uh, it actually was happening <clears throat> before I even found out about it, going down that path. And it had gone about um, nine months, and um, and then the line producer got in touch with me, and he said, you know what, there's this show we're doing, it's for Disney, you used to be a Disney feature animator, so I thought you'd have a perspective on this. It's supposed to explain it to the public, uh, it feels like the energy is going out of it, we've got a couple scenarios, Disney's been involved, Frank and Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson have come over and collaborated, but it just feels like the wind is going out of our sails. Can you just come take a look? So I went over and uh, took a look at it, and it was all bogged down in, in technical details. And I just went, man, every, every studio that does animation has the same bragging rights. That's not what makes Disney special. So I got in this whole soapbox about at Disney, uh, you don't pick a color because it's pretty. You pick a color because of what it says about the character's emotion at that moment. You don't pick a piece of furniture because it looks cool. It's like, what does it say about the status of that character, their, their plight? Uh, you know, uh, every single thing. Every department is the story department, basically. And it's all about emotion. And I said, that's the story of what makes Disney special. Everybody's got the same amount of drawings and all that technical stuff. So, um, so anyway, I, that, that, I, I was able, fortunately, to um, go from just being somebody they would ask an opinion of to they just suddenly said, okay, uh, you're directing it. And I was like, what? <laughs> I had, had no intention, but they just saw my passion. They knew my background was at Disney. So they just sort of threw it in my lap, and I ran with it. And so by the time it came out, you, you were able to step-by-step see how Disney animation is done and realize that it's all about emotion and it's not about technical things. It's all about storytelling and character. And so <clears throat> we got to take Robin Williams into the world of animation with Walter Cronkite as the host. And by the time you're done, it's funny, it's involving, it's emotional, it's charming. And um, you realize that uh, you know the Disney approach is special because it's all built around emotion. So... That was our task. So when Disney signed you on to this project, did they say, this is what we want? Or did they say, you take it from here, uh, what you just told us, make it, make that feeling and emotion come out in the film. Just make a screenplay that's already there. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was just became blank slate. When I came, got involved because, well, the, here's the scenario. And, and this sort of goes back to a whole... We, we can go back through the passions that drove me to it. But, but the logistics were, it had started, 
outside of Disney, an independent contractor that was going to do a film for Disney. And um, they had spent nine, ten months on it. Uh, they had two different scenarios. There was a Siskel and Ebert explaining animation to you scenario. There was a Carol Burnett and Donald Duck explain animation to you scenario. And I had gone to school with Mark Kirkland, and he was a line producer on it. And so they felt like the Disney between the Disney collaborators who were coming to look at it and their own efforts, everybody would worked really hard, but it just seemed like there was no like center point. There was no thrill, the excitement. He, he described it as wind going out of the sails, you know, and they just felt like, uh-oh, we think this might collapse. We might lose the gig. They might give it to somebody else. I mean, it was really that kind of crisis moment. And so the only request to me was, can you come tell us what you think of it? Just be the fresh point of view. Tell us what you think. And so... I went in just only as to deliver my two cents uh, as fresh eyes. And I, like I was telling you, I had been teacher's assistant for the very first year of the CalArts program. So I had actually had a desk at Disney while I was still in high school. And Disney had enlisted me to then become teacher's assistant for the first year of the college program. And so Lassiter and Brad Bird and those people were my classmates as I went through. And then there were some of us that were uh, taken from CalArts over into the, uh, <clears throat> to the Disney feature department. And so, you know, we'd gone through that whole process together and, and we were very passionate about, uh, about animation and what it could be and the potentials. And then we had sort of gotten frustrated because the, you know, the veterans who were still there, uh, they had such great things to say. They were such great mentors and teachers and inspiring us. And then we felt like, but under the like under the the sort of um, uh, you know the structure that existed then as they were retiring, we didn't feel like like the studio was really being as adventurous as they used to be, and so we kept looking for where are ways we could really do the kind of adventurous, fun, wild things that these veterans did in their day, and they're they're encouraging us to do it. So we were we our radar was out looking for ways to 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 pursue things uh, that would really be worthy of the of the you know the Disney sort of tradition. And um, so, you know, when I came in and looked at this and it seemed like it was really just uh, underselling what Disney animation even was, it's like all that history that I already had and I already sp spent a few years at that point in and out of the, of the Disney feature animation department, it just, it just boiled over in me that like I was passionately saying, no, that's not what the Disney's about. This is what Disney's about. And the next morning, they said, well, let's talk again in the morning. And I took in a scenario where I said, well, I wouldn't have Siskel and Ebert breaking down analytical things. And Carol Burnett and Donald is amusing, but again, they're just talking about how many drawings and you stack them and they'd go to the moon. That's technical stuff. I, and so I suggested, I said, I would take somebody like Robin Williams and let him step by step go into the animated world, feel what it's like, experience that it's, it's all about emotion and storytelling. It's not about the technical side. And, you know, so I, I just did this pitch the, the next morning. And um, so they they just took a deep breath. This was not at all. This wasn't Plan A or Plan B. This was like Plan Z. They like hadn't even considered that. So, and I had to hand it to uh, to the team there um, that was had contracted to do this for Disney. They <clears throat> it took some guts. They sort of sat around this conference table, and I was doing my soapbox thing. And they said, "Well, uh, let me make a call." So. Uh, the producer called, uh, I think it was Peter Schneider at the time, and said, uh, you know what we've been working on for the last nine, ten months? Um, basically, we're going to unplug all of that. What? <laughs> they were like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, no, no, wait, Jerry came in with some really cool ideas, and you know, he used to be a Disney feature animator. It's like, this better be good. So there was high expectation and tension and everything. Uh, so they said, well, uh, you got a week to get it ready for Schneider to look at. And I was like, what do you mean I have a week? to? Get? I just gave you my opinion like you asked. And they're like, well, no, you should do this. So it just suddenly was I had said, no, don't go that way. I would suggest you go this way. And they said, great, take it. So I suddenly was like, okay. Uh, and it was, like, it, was, it was pretty funny that Tom Enriquez was – was on their staff uh, as an artist, and he's he's brilliant. And so it, it was sort of like the old days of you know you see the 
the stories about the newspaper business where somebody's pacing around and it's going, all right, take this down, you know, and somebody's there with a pad and they, it's like, they dictate and walk around and pace. And I actually was doing that. I was like pacing around the office, talking to Tom and Tom was madly sketching and you mean like this? No more like that, whatever. And we pin it up on the wall and started it going. And so just suddenly I was in the thick of it and they're like, okay, you're passionate about it. You have a whole different idea. Run with it. We like it. Um, so I, I showed it to, um, Peter then, and uh, people like Bruce Smith, you know, people started ro- ro- uh, rolling into the team with me. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, I showed it to Schneider, and he said, okay, you got a month, and show it to Jeffrey. Uh, so, you know, it, uh, it just rolled from there. So it was, it was a complete change of, of, uh, of plans on everyone's part. And like I say, the producers were really gutsy to say, basically, we're throwing out all the work that's come till now and we're starting over again and we think Jerry's idea is, is really cool and we're going to all build on that together. So uh, it was great. So and, you know, the, in the credits when you saw that latest one where it has all of us that worked on it together um, in the credits and you see you know, that I did story and screenplay and directed by, none of that was planned and what it was wasn't planned. It was, it was just, uh, it, you know, it... it it's what occurred to me when, when I looked at what they had as, an, as the alternative, and we went for it. And, um, and I think I had, I had mentioned this to you before once, but uh, the idea of casting Robin Williams in something for Disney Animation was also considered really risky, and uh, a lot of people were worried about it. So he was the considered, you know, the crotch-grabbing adult entertainer, and he had just been in Good Morning Vietnam, and... They were like, wait a minute, you know, the Robin Williams in Disney animation and, you know, we have a lot of families and there's a lot of people, very traditional values and stuff. And you that, know, like, uh, that was like a surprise on Disney's part for accepting that. So why do you think that they decided, yes, sure, go ahead? Well, I think there were there were two things that came to bear. One is I, I, I argued passionately, that did the what would Walt do argument and it went this way. Uh, you know, you look back on something like uh, Pinocchio. And, you know, at, now you look at Jiminy Cricket and, you know, he's just such a cute, charming character. And you go, oh, that was like a really family, fun, charming choice by Walt. But you know what? Cliff Edwards, uh, the, the guy who voiced Jiminy Cricket, was an uh, uh, adult club entertainer, uh, Ukulele Ike. And so he was – they were used to, to him as, a, you know, an adult nightclub uh, guy who had come out of vaudeville and uh, – you know, after the kids were all asleep, he was making the adults laugh at night at the clubs. And Walt cast him in Pinocchio. So we look back on it and go, oh, it's a nostalgic, safe, family charming thing. At the time, people go see the film and go, hey, I just saw that guy at the nightclub, sweetheart. We went there after the kids kids were with the babysitter. We went and laughed our ass <laughs> with the uh, adult comedy he did. And he's Jiminy Cricket in this film. Uh, and we just saw him last month, you know. So it was a very contemporary choice that Walt made at the time. And it was mixing somebody from the, you know, the, who connected directly with the adults in the audience. But, of course, the material he gave them was, was charming. And so it was an interesting bridge at the time. So I just said, look, it's, it's the equivalent choice now where you're taking Robin, who's charming as heck. And, yes, he does a lot of the adult stuff. But... Um, Believe me, this is the equivalent kind of choice. We're taking somebody that can be edgy as heck, but is also has the charm like you wouldn't believe. And if we just guide him into, you know, staying on, sort of in our zone, uh, I think it'll be great. And so that was my argument. And then the other half of it was there was a new – it was a new day at Disney. You know, I had come in originally under Ron Miller, who was Walt's son-in-law, uh, who was running the studio. And then it had gone through Richard Berger, who was running the studio after that, and then it became Katzenberg and Eisner. And, you know, when Katzenberg and Eisner came in, they, they as in terms of the live action films that Disney was doing, they were trying to be, develop a lot more edge. You know, they, they were brought in, uh, you know, Touchstone and uh, Hollywood Pictures, and they were pushing the whole Disney uh, sort of brand into different areas. And so, as I was talking to Katzenberg about it, 
he was more of a contemporary mind. He had already been pushing Disney that direction in certain departments. And so he was a receptive ear. You know, I think that was unique. If I'd made the same argument to back in the Ron Miller days, I, I'm not sure if he would have gone for it. But I think that Katzenberg was the kind of guy who was mixing in mainstream Hollywood who was saying, you know what, Disney is too tame. It needs to develop a little bit more of an edge. And he'd already you know, taking that step in the world of live action. And so uh, he was ready. So, and, and I appreciated that. So when you were writing the script, writing a script, I've taken classes for that before. And if you're thinking about a specific person for a specific role, you never know if you're going to get that person, especially if you're going to make it as that person. It's hard to explain. Walter Cronkite, because right. you're using actually Walter Cronkite. He's playing yes. himself. So <laughs> yeah. when you're writing a script for that, do you do you just go ahead and write um, a very uh, bland role, and then w and then Walter Cronkite can come in later, or do you write it specifically for Walter Cronkite no, I, once you find out he's involved with the project? Uh, well, I had I had pitched that those would be the two people, and from day one, as soon as I was as soon as they had said yes, take it, um, I committed a hundred percent that it was going to be them, and just tried to everything that everything that went up on the boards, everything that I wrote was trying to capture exactly who they are. And and so that when people like Katzenberg reviewed it for the first time, he was seeing it tilted exactly towards those two people. Not like, here's the generic entertainment, now imagine an overlay of these two people cast in it. Um, in fact, as we took it into Story Reel, um, I had the brilliant Corey Burton, uh, voice talent, do a dead-on Robin Williams and Walter Cronkite impression. He can do both. And um, so, you know, I, and actually I played some of the uh, story reel to Eisner, and Eisner thought I had actually gotten Robin and Walter to uh, give me scratch track. So he, he thought it was them. So, you know, it was, it was a total commitment to just saying, this is who we plan to have. This is the pitch. It's not just pitching this project. It's pitching this project with these two people. And um, it's kind of a an all, all, or, all or nothing dive, you know, into the deep end. And uh, fortunately, it all came together. And and also one of the interesting reasons that it, it really fell into place was uh, Robin was very intrigued by Walter and totally respected him. Uh, and oh my gosh, when I met with Robin, he was just telling me all. He was telling me. Walter's entire history and his significance in history, in you know, in American history and global history, and uh, all these trivia details and stuff. It's like, wow, Robin really knows his Walter data. And then when I met with uh, with Cronkite, he was very interested in uh, in Robin and just thought he was a very intriguing entertainer and that he was really looking forward to meeting him. And so you had these two people who were so happy to be cast together. And admired each other. I mean, wow, what are, what are the chances of that? But that that really seemed to be but part, of, part of the magnetism of what happened was you had these two people wanting it to happen, you know. And extreme opposites. And it was so nice to see Robin Williams. He was uh, made a Dis Disney legend a couple years ago. And right. he mentions Walter in his speech. Um, he right. says Walter told him a joke called... Um, uh, roses are red. Uh, I love you in red. I love you in blue. But most of all, I love you in blue. And did the whole Walter Cronkite impression um, and thanked Walter, Walter too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so I just I, I think that that's and it and you know it was only a couple years ago he did that. So his right. respect is still there for the man, and he still remembers doing that yeah. short. You know, after all these years. Yeah, and it's, and a lot of people don't know that that short was the first use of him in Disney animation, and that because of the success of that. And because of the specific sequence where I had him improvise like crazy <laughs> and then had um, – actually, it was uh, animator Franz Vischer who did the most of the metamorphosis animation. Um, but, you know, we did him through metamorphosis where he could be uh, anything that the animator could, uh, could draw, he could be. And so, hey, hey, animator, why don't we have some fun? You know, and he's <laughs> headed off into that uh, – you know, and uh, and so the metamorphosis sequence where he was just improvising and the animator went along with the improvisation and he changed it to this and that and that and that um, was really an inspiration for the genie role in Aladdin. And um, and so uh, John, John Musker and Ron Clements, who directed it, uh, told me later 
uh, that, you know, it, it completely influenced the choice of casting him and sort of how he would be the, like the whole flavor of the film, the whole flavor of what happened with Disney features. It, it kind of tilted a bunch of dominoes in a whole different direction after that, after the short. And they said, you know, that's a, a significant thing. And so we're, we're going to put a permanent embedded thank you to your project in the feature. And so uh, they invited me to the premiere and told me to look for it. And I, it, I was just caught up in their movie and completely forgot about it until at the very end when Genie gets his freedom and he goes zipping away through time and he comes back and he's wearing the, uh, the Hawaiian shirt and the goofy hat and all that stuff. Um, that's exactly the outfit that in my film Robin wears when he comes into uh, – steps into the scene in live action. And uh, it was a direct – nod to uh to the short at that moment and it was funny because later all of us who worked on on the short <clears throat> we saw these dolls in in the store of genie dressed up in our back to neverland outfit we're like <laughs> we're like wait a minute shouldn't our team get a cut of this toy because we <laughs> came up with the casting and the costume <laughs> Uh, but anyway, it's 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 fun to see that, and even very recently, some of the some of the current Disney uh, um, uh, regime, who's uh, you know now presiding over a very creative blooming of of a lot of different aspects of Disney. I think there's a lot of great things going on, but some of them were were shocked to discover that recently. And um, I met with some high level people, and they were sort of reviewing my history, and they're like. Wait a minute, that came first? It's like, yeah, that's why he was cast in Aladdin. It's like, look at this, look at our shot, and now look at this uh, scene from Aladdin. They're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. So, <laughs> so it's still kind of a piece of trivia that's, uh, that surprises people. Now, they, when they recorded voiceover for Aladdin with Robin Williams as the genie, the animators <laughs> ended up uh, with over 14 hours of material of voiceover. Right. So mm -hmm. um, did you have many unused takes, scenes, voiceover clips of Robin adding jokes to the script and such? Oh, uh, absolutely. And, it, you know, it was funny, the process, because when I was writing, uh, I had to write what he might say, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm writing all these Robin Williams-esque kind of things, you know, and um, and the process was I was going to go meet with him uh, first, record him, and then I could get, uh, you know, start sorting through that stuff and give it to the animators to start some test animation going and uh, give them videos of Robin while he was recording so they could start to imitate his body language and all that good stuff. Um, and then I was going to prep the live action and shoot the live action as a, a you know the second wave of effort mm -hmm. and uh so i first met with him for the for the audio recording and so i had done all these storyboards um with me and my team and had all my dialogue pinned underneath of what he was going to say <laughs> and uh so he's like oh i hope you don't mind if i mess around with some of this and i said well <laughs> robin that's the reason we hired you is be exactly. And I said, look, when I was pitching it to the executives, I had to give them an example of what you might say. So I said, look, I, as long as you land on this line that prompts Walter for his next line, that's cool if you play around in here, but you land on this line because Walter needs that to set up what he says. And then I said, here's another area where you can play in. Here's another area where you can play in. Here's another. And he said, oh, well, I don't want to change everything. There's some good writing here, you know. And so he was like sort of met halfway. And, uh, and we got together in the studio. And, and it was interesting because he was there with, uh, with Marsha. And uh, we, you know, she, and she was great. She was really uh, helping, uh, to, you know, he had, he had had some kind of wild times and everything and she was helping stabilize him in those days and uh so she was there with us in the in the engineer booth and everything and so he's recording i'm throwing out ideas to him he's improvising he's playing with it and he would ask for all oh, you know what were some ideas for certain film titles or characters or whatever so i'd toss things in and it was like tossing tossing items into like a creative Cuisinart and then it would like swirl around and things would fly out different ways. But he loved getting sort of, uh, you know, input material to play with. And, and we were going on and on and on. And it's, it's sort of the clock is ticking and it looks like we're near the end of the session, but, but we're just having so much fun. And there's more material that we kind of haven't gotten to in the first draft because we're playing so much along the way. And so we kind of quietly asked Marsha, you know, it's, uh, 
it's kind of going past the original agreement of the time we were booking and we'd like to continue with him but it's been kind of a long session what do you, how do you think he's going to feel about it what do you think we should do we want to make sure that you're comfortable with this and she goes look if we leave now he's he's totally revved up he's having fun with you guys and if we leave now um he, he doesn't he isn't going to want to just go home and go to sleep he's going to want to stop at a club or something and when he's there they're going to go oh there's robin williams and they're going to go come up on stage and he's going to go on stage and we'll be three hours in a club with him entertaining the crowd so so please keep him here (laughs) (laughs) and just keep him in front of the microphone and uh you know i'd I'd rather finish the day that way tonight so we're like okay thank you and so we just stayed recording and yes there was a, a wealth of material so you know when it came to to all those segments, uh, and especially the metamorphosis thing. Oh my gosh, that could have been a could have been a ten minute segment just with with the gyms, you know. And it had to obviously be cut so far down that it was just a few seconds long. So uh, yeah, it was it was like a wealth of uh, just uh, you know too many alter too many good options, um, which is a great problem to have. I love looking at these photos on your uh, website, which people, you guys can go and uh-huh. see them for yourself at www.jerryrees.com. Um, he has With no mid- E at the end, by the way. Yeah, no E's. It's, I'm not part of the candy empire. <laughs> it's R-E-E-S. Um, but there's photos of Marsha there with Robin, and um, it looks like they're enjoying um, Bruce Smith's um, animation scenes when he's just showing. I think that's the, the scene where the metamorphosis scene that they're showing. Well, actually... Um, Actually, Bruce, it was interesting because, you know, everybody that was in Back to Neverland as the people that make the films actually were on my staff. <laughs> um, but Bruce Smith had done a lot of animation of, of Robin. But, um, but, he, but even though Bruce was sitting at the desk in that scene and says, all right, let's go and starts animating. And actually, the animation you're looking at was from Franz, who's also in the background of that picture. Franz is, is looking on. I think Bruce I think Bruce was flipping for him the scene where it's like um, where he's doing the game show thing with, oh. uh, with Captain Hook. You know, <laughs> you know uh, he's also a villain, you know, whatever the, the little <laughs> game show clues. And, uh, Captain And oh. where he says, yeah, yeah. So I, I think he was showing him that scene where he's floating, you know, hey, Tink, slip me some wing, you know, that kind of thing. I think was what, what Bruce was showing him. Uh, but, yeah, Bruce had done, uh, was like my directing animator who had done first test animation to sort of get the, the, the movement, uh, really capturing the essence of Robin and everything. But... Um, but yeah, I, th- I think I think that's what he was showing. But I love that little sequence of events because it shows him first, uh, sort of wondering and looking at it, and then just busting up once he sees it flipped, the the drawings flipped, and he's come alive. And you just see that Robin is delighted in that in that photograph, and, and that and that's just another really cool thing about that I found out about Robin that it, just the little context around those photos is that was during the live action shoot and we'd already had time for um you know for robin to do uh, for for the uh, animators i should say to do quite a bit of test animation of robin so that was underway and then they were uh so they were able to come to the set and now show some some of the things that they had finished so um if we'd started at the same time they wouldn't have been far enough along but they'd already had a couple months of work ahead of time and so they had stuff to share and um I had arranged with the producers to to just bring the animators by so they could meet. You know, I just thought they loved doing Robin, and Robin would probably get a kick out of meeting them. So, so actually, I like invited all the animators to the set, and while we were moving from uh, one stage to another on the Raleigh. Raleigh stages in Hollywood I knew we had to make a big move from one stage to another so I went okay while we're moving instead of going to your trailer why don't you just hang out here with the uh, with the animators and they can show you what they're up to uh, so he he went and spent time with them and the photographs show some of that and then he came back to me before he retired to his trailer and he just he was so moved he was he was on the verge of tears. He had moist eyes and he just said, oh, I was really flattened. These people are so talented. And he was just saying how special they were and just how much he admired what they do and and uh, that he was moved and touched. And I thought, wow, the, the fact that he would bother to come tell me that 
um, and have that emotional reaction was just, uh, you know, just it's such a wonderful layer of of the real Robin, the Robin who's off screen to find out about, and it's, it's like he's a real genuine guy, a down to earth person, and he mm-hmm. me- and he mentions how uh, he mentioned in his speech how much he appreciates all animators, including the ones that were used in Aladdin for animating at all, you know, that, that's, <laughs> right. one, that's wonderful that he mentions that as well, which is very nice. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, he, he thought it was just kind of magical that they could take a little version of him and make it seem <laughs> like it was like it had his personality, you know. Um, there's a, I think there's a picture of uh, Daryl Rooney and Rebecca, my wife, who was also – we met at Disney. She came through Art Center into Disney, and I came through Cal Arts into Disney. Aww. And so we worked together on some projects. She was actually on the Aladdin story team after that. Um, but she was an animator on Back to Neverland as well, and she was a directing animator on Toaster, actually. Um, but you see her there, and I think Dar- Daryl's hugging her while Robin is, uh, is signing – uh, a, a piece of art for her, and uh, that, that's one of the photos on the on the website there. Um, but it, there was just it was definitely a mutual admiration society where the animators just so admired the performance ability uh, of Robin, and then Robin just did not take anything for granted in in their ability to create. And she had been one of the people that had really captured some of his essential moves. Um, she even snuck in a little bit of the kind of you know, he he kind of does the little kid thing of kind of cupping his hands over his crotch a little bit. Uh, you know, when he's talking <laughs> to Captain Hook, and you know, but it was it wasn't meant to be racy, but it just was so. It's such a uh, even when he's not doing the adult humor, there were certain sort of body language things that kept happening again and again. And so, uh, you know, she was one of the animators that really found essential bits like that to stick in. And so when it was flipped, and he'd look at it, it was like, oh my god, that's what I do. <laughs> it's like that's that's me. Um, so I, and I think he really felt it, and yeah, so that was that was great. Uh, you have two different versions of uh, this film: one that includes the cell uh, paint process, uh, and then a digital process, which I did not know. I, I did not could not tell the right. difference because there's not many uh, copies of the film online. Right. Um, right. Uh, so when was th- when did this update occur, and and why? Well, uh, you know the original film. We uh, it actually was 1988 when I started working on that, and I think we uh, I think we opened it in '89. I think was when Disney MGM Studios opened, and I, I actually um, by the time I was finished with the process, I had juggled four projects overlapping. Back to Neverland being the first to to open in the Disney MGM Studios theme park. So uh, so it was a busy busy time, and so it was and it was way back. So you know, we did not have digital ink and paint um, happening back then. It was it was cell paint for sure. So um, you know, of course, that's that's what was in the original film. And then you know, it played for many many years. And then after so much time had gone by, the industry standard, uh, Disney and everywhere else, was digital uh, rather than cells. So you know, we'd had a really cute thing where I had shot from below uh, an ink and paint desk through the pane of glass to, to look up through and see the artist as she was painting the cell. And so you saw a little line art Robin and his color being filled in with the paintbrush. And he's talking to her about his color and just, uh, you know, he would choose different colors than she did and whatever. So she's just kind of amused by him. And so that that's what had been playing for all that time. And, you know, that included um, the the scenes where he's being filmed. So there was the big camera platform with the, the glass platen that would uh, slap down over the cell and hold it against the background and the big camera taking a traditional photograph of that. And so there were a number of things that were that had evolved into a different thing. And so uh, I guess the conversation that had been going on while I was busy with many, many other things is it was, you know, people really liked it. It was sort of a, a beloved thing. It had earned its place um, and it played for many years. But now people were starting to notice that some of the messaging was out of date in terms of the technology. It's like the the core message about how every department is the story department and all that stuff was completely valid, is still valid. Actually, Pixar became the keepers of that tradition while Disney lost its way for a while. So that's like totally 
still there. But the technology that's that's supporting that story about the emotional core to Disney had had changed. So the public was starting to notice that, and the decision was – well, there were sort of two decision points. One was, do you retire the, the film, or do you update it and let it play in the park a while longer? And they they had started to have like this whole other team just deal with cutting and pasting or whatever. So uh, thankfully, uh, a producer on it, and this was many, many years later, but a producer on it and went, you know what? Um, let's talk to Jerry again. You know, this was his baby back when. Um, so they talked to me about it and showed me, and uh, I just immediately was going, oh, man, there's so much of this we can protect. There's so much that we can keep without it looking cut and paste. I mean, we can have it look like it was the original intention if we're careful. And um, there were certain things that had to be very judiciously shot. And one of them was a scene with um, with uh, Brian McEntee, who was, who was one of the illustrators doing layout and design. And there was a picture of him sitting at the desk and he's He's drawing the uh, uh, the pirate ship where a little animated Robin is taking a look around and mm-hmm. and uh, talking. So that we had to reshoot that with him in it. <clears throat> so I'm like, okay, I have to get back with Brian McEntee and same clothes. <laughs> sit him there, and so I checked. I crossed my fingers, and and yes, he had. I think it was a Brooks Brothers shirt, and he had bought like eight of them back when because he loved them and had like crisp new versions of the same shirt he'd worn like 10 12 years earlier so he came to the set and got in exactly the perfect matching wardrobe and we were able to shoot that oh scene it was so amazing i was like brian i'm glad you're like obsessed with certain things uh and it's it, it's a blessing to me and then uh for robin uh, for walter it was it was tricky because you know we couldn't just say hey walter stop what you're doing and come back and Plus, you know, the years had, had uh, you know, changed his sort of appearance and voice uh, a little bit more than, than it had done with Brian at Brian's much younger age. <laughs> so um, so I went back to the, the magic choice, which is Corey Burton, voice genius, um, did the new voice stuff to match. So he matched the, the Cronkite that I'd recorded all those years ago, did a voice match and gave me the new dialogue that I had written for him and then I was careful about using his uh, body double it was Walter's approved body double that would go around with him to different film projects and and did it so you'd see his hand you'd see him like full figure from the back you'd see different things and then I used as much of our original Walter footage as possible on his face uh, in and around the things that we had to change so you know by the time it was done uh, like you know you had seen it and you didn't realize that it was uh, it was a second draft that there were it was a pastiche of old and new things put together. But uh, I was so glad that they came to me and said, instead of this looking like either retiring or looking sort of hodgepodge, can you as the you know writer, director of the first one, figure a way that it could just sort of blend and look like it was intended. And so, uh, so I really dove in and, and, and even brought back uh, Reed Smoot, who was our original cinematographer, to shoot the matching – Footage, so that was a really nice piece of uh, of continuity for us. That he, well, I couldn't you know, tell the difference, so <laughs> I, well, I think I, a lot yeah. of people couldn't tell the difference. So good job on your part there. That was, I didn't even realize there were two versions, but that's really cool because it all matched up because they had uh, animators after the film that you could see actually working on right. animation projects. Um, right. So at at the end of the short. Guests could walk outside the theater, like I just said, and right. see working animators at the drawing boards, as well as um, they had this big display case uh, that showed how Robin's character was created for the film. Do you know if there are any storyboards that you used for the film that were included in the display, as well as props or costumes? Well, um, I didn't look at that display, um, but if it was any original material, then yes, it was because nobody else did it. <laughs> it was like just our little our little team. That's like that little crawl of credits. That's uh, those are the only hands that touched it. So uh, so Sometimes if they, they put up a display, so. it was from from our team. So oh good okay. Uh, so I'm sure I'm sure it was genuine. 
Oh, good. Thank goodness. It's still like <laughs> yeah. the same colored uh, floor. It's like that mustard color in uh-huh. the whole room. I don't know if you remember going through it, but it, it, it's still kind of the same, but all the windows have been uh, colored in with uh, green paint, so you can't see right. what's beyond there. So you, you don't know for sure if there's right. anything behind there, if it's just storage now, which is really sad because... You know, so they took your film out in 2003, so it has been 10 years since it has been seen in the parks, but it was right. put in there when the park opened, I think, on May 4th, 89. Of 89, 89 right? yeah. 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 So um, it was there for a long time, and, and the video clips that I see of it, uh, people still laugh at, you know, when uh, – Robin Williams comments that uh, Tinkerbell looks like Barbara Streisand as bright as right. Barbara Streisand as a star. Right. Or when he says, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like could be even... The, or it's like being in the presence of Barbara Streisand. <laughs> I know. It was or, funny. Hey, you, know what, you know what was so cool? It was, um, I was talking about how they enjoyed each other's company. And um, it was just so fun to, to sense that from Robin and then sense it from Walter. And... Um, and then when they were together to see how much they made each other laugh and have fun. And, um, oh, gosh, I wish I had, uh, I wish I'd had, like, a recorder rolling at the time. But, you know, the, you know, the, the big, huge books Yes. In, on the set. You know, we actually built huge books. We didn't do, like, a matte painting or some <laughs> digital thing. Or... I mean, we, yeah, you could walk into the set and they were there. And, and uh, so... During some of the the takes, they were supposed to walk out from between books that were leaning against each other. So, you know, they were these tiny guys underneath the big books in the shadows. And they're waiting for me to call action and stroll out from the shadows into the light. And and I was I would just be, you know, working with my guys getting ready. And I'd hear, <laughs> you know, it was like... <laughs> It was like Walter making Robin laugh and Robin making Walter, and, but we could never quite tell what they were saying. But they were just having a blast with each other. <laughs> and um, later, when I went to record uh, a, a few additional things from Robin in uh, in New York, he was at the doing Waiting for Godot with uh, Steve Martin, and it, that was the first time I met Steve when I went to uh, to record uh, Robin. And years later, I would would work with Steve. Um, but when I went to New York to, to record that, he was talking about that he and Marsha had gone to to have dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Cronkite. And so they had a friendship that kept going after after our filming was done. And, and when I was first pitching to Walter what the film would be and that he would be co-starring with Robin, uh, that, that was just such a funny scenario because it started with this – this whole feeling of an entourage, a big parade going to New York to meet with with Walter, and that had actually happened um, here in California with Robin. That that you know when when I had done my pitch to Katzenberg and the guys, and they they loved the project and they loved the idea of Robin being cast in it, and they dealt with his management. And he was cast. He came by, and I gave him a tour of all the storyboards. Before we recorded or anything, it was just like, a hello, here's what the project is. Pretty soon we're going to record. After that, we're going to film. But just here's what it is. You get to know it. And there was a parade. So it was like me and Robin up at the storyboards that were pinned on the wall going around. And then you'd hear sort of like a stampede of feet behind. And there was there was uh, Katzenberg and, and then like uh, – uh, Larry Bresner and different, a whole bunch of people that were management and agents and lawyers, and it was like all the people that came with uh, with Robin, you know, and um, and it was funny. I was glad that they were all there for that moment, though, because there was one line that was kind of uh, a little bit of uh, a dig at the at how corporate things can be sometimes. Where he says, you know, ha. Ah! Look, everybody, I'm a corporate symbol, you know, at the end when he's yeah. sneaky. Um, that actually was not a Robin improv. That was something that one of my great storyboard guys, Steve Moore, had come up with that. when he, It's like I just asked him, like, do a whole bunch of sketches of what he might be. And, and um, so before I even recorded Robin, um, Steve Moore had come up with that idea of, uh, as he, Mickey Massey says, I'm a corporate symbol. And, you know, Steve is just kind of wry that way. He has funny ideas. So when I was had the whole entourage, the parade following Robin, and I get to that board and I pitch it, Robin busted up. That was like his biggest laugh. And Katzenberg and everybody turned to see what he had, was laughing at, and it was that joke. And when we recorded it, Robin kept it in. 
And I think I think it made Jeffrey a little more, uh, you know, apt to keep it in because I thought we were all of us on the staff were like, okay, when is Disney going to ask us to cut this out? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I think the fact that during like all the parade of people was there and they all watched Robin bust a gut at that joke, and they're like, okay, I guess he, the genius loves it and he's going to record it, so I guess we have to leave it in, and uh, you know, and the public loved thought it was really nice of oh Disney. they loved so a little, it a little self-effacing and <laughs> i it, loved you know, it I think that, yeah so i but i think that so the uh, the parade the entourage witnessing that moment i think was was a, a good thing creatively so then the same sort of big parade was supposed to happen with cronkite and then as i was getting ready to travel i started hearing oh well i forget exactly the sequence of events but it was like eisner was going to Tokyo or um, because of the Tokyo Disneyland stuff or something like that. So he was going to be gone. And then they said, well, if he's going to be gone, then it's not really kosher for Katzenberg to go with his group because it sort of makes it look like they're more important than Eisner's group. And then it was like, well, but then if he's not going to go, then Schneider is is not really at that level of representation. So it's like, what, Katzberg's not going to go, but Schneider gets to go. So then it's like everybody kept falling off the list for these whole, you know, it was grand political network reasons that I didn't really, I wasn't really tapping into. I was just busy with the creative stuff. But um, so by the time I got off the plane, uh, we went into, they had reserved this big, huge conference room for us all to meet in, right? So you walk in and it's the dark wood and the long table and the reflections in the long table. And... Uh, echoing footsteps, and there's only two sets of footsteps. It's Walter Cronkite and Jerry Reese, and that's the only two people in this huge place. <laughs> so uh, we kind of hunkered down at the end, one end of the long conference table, and I opened a notebook of storyboards and took him through it. And he was busting a gup at what we had storyboarded that Robin might do and how the interplay would happen. And he said, I'm very curious to meet that man you know he's like very <laughs> very interested and and so it was cool to see that he was uh you know anticipating that and and uh and looking forward to it but it just was so weird we all we kind of looked around and it was it was just, it was just it was sort of glaringly obvious that we were two people in a giant com empty conference room and uh but anyway it was it was all great and cordial and fun and and there had been this whole like um, strategy that had been built in case it was a big crowded entourage room where it was like I had different people on the team going, okay, you're going to have the, the videotape of the story reel. Don't show it to anybody because we don't want to get it into other people's hands, but have it with you. And if it's needed to help sell him on it, if he's not sure, you can show it to him and it's entertaining. And But then, then Katzenberg will want it and Eisner will want it and Snyder will want it and all the people will want it. So, uh, so be careful about that. And uh, so first, don't even act like you have it. But then if you have to show it to them, then stick it back in your briefcase. And if they say, oh, we want to we wanna see that, then like, go to the bathroom, uh, uh, peel the label off of it, stick it in the trash can, put paper towels over top of it, come out, and they're like, oh, yeah, let me look for that. Open the suitcase. You can't find it. Uh, where did it go? Let's go back to the conference room. It was like this whole thing, right? <laughs> and I'm like, perhaps I can just say, you can look at it, but we don't want you to have it. <laughs> and, Make it a little bit easier. It, yeah. It's like, I'll just say, this isn't a, like, I'm happy for you to look at it, but I'm not giving anyone this copy. I've only got one with me, and it stays with me. So anyway, um, the eyes looking back at me were thought I was insane, but I was like, no, to me, that's the way you do it. So, <laughs> but anyway. Don't try to hide but not, it. <laughs> but none of that was necessary because it was just me and Walter, and, uh, and he was good. great. But, but I, I've got to, to express my admiration for him and, uh, and rib him about one thing. I don't know if you were aware of it, but um, probably at, at your age, it's happened way before your time, but um, – you may be aware of it. He did a show, Walter Cronkite did a show called the, the 21st Century. And it played, I believe it was every Friday night. So when I was uh, adolescent and I would tune into that and it was all about the future. And he was talking about what the future was going to bring and it was cool science. Um, and man, it was like hovercrafts and jetpacks and all kinds of stuff. And, and um, so 
<laughs> when we got together, I said, uh, and we chatted for a while and everything was all chummy. I said, Walter, I got to call you on something though, because you're, you've been voted the most trusted voice in America and arguably the world. I mean, there was a survey and they said the most trusted voice was Walter Cronkite. And, um, you know, I used to watch your show faithfully. And on that show, you promised me that in 1980, I'd have a jetpack. Walter, where's my jetpack? <laughs> it's like, whoa. Uh, but uh, that was fun. And then um, he came out and he was so gracious. And um, he said hello to my parents, which was a big day for them. They, they loved that. He was very gracious. And uh, um, he was just a charming guy to be around. And, you know, it's with both of these guys, I was so happy that, you know how it is. You, you, you see people on the screen. You see them, you know, in their – it's a public persona. And you, you, when you meet them personally behind the scenes, you have no idea if they're really going to be that person. But you hope they are because that's kind of what you have fallen in love with over the years is, is that thing they present to the public. And in both cases, for Robin and Walter, they were exactly what you'd expect them to, and hope they would be. Uh, you know, Walter was just – charming and intelligent had the twinkle in his eye that you were always used to and it's just uh it was just a treat uh a treat to be around him but i did hear i did get one side of him that most people don't don't see and he he told me a couple blue jokes from the republican convention that he'd heard so it was uh <laughs> hearing walter cronkite telling uh blue blue jokes was uh that was part, that was part i hadn't expected but but i will uh i will restrain myself and not convey them to you so <laughs> <laughs> It'll be my secret. Oh darn! <laughs> but I know that um he he was the narrator of uh, Spaceship Earth, uh, starting in '86, and then they removed his narration in '94 to make way for Jeremy Irons. So I think uh, it was a total of two Disney projects Walter was ever attached to, and they were during where they were within a couple years of one another, which is very interesting too. Right, and it, but it was interesting that he did a – it was more peripheral, but he did a special for Disney back when I was on the Tron crew because I was – there were two of us on the first Tron that were storyboard artists for the computer graphics stuff. So mm -hmm. Bill Croyer and I were the – like we got a – two of us had the credit computer graphics choreographer. And that what that really meant was we storyboarded all the things that were going to be pure CG, and then we shepherded them through – Triple I and Magi to enable and stuff to the to the finish line. So we'd like storyboard it, show it to uh, Lisberger, and then we'd take it out, like go travel to New York or to uh, Santa Monica, and, and sit there with the team and uh, shepherd them through what the boards meant and the timing and all the different stuff like that. So Cronkite did a um, he did a special about. Tron and sort of dressed up in these outfits where it had reflective materials. So it would look like he was glowing and stuff. Um, so it was interesting that Cronkite had kind of done some Disney content even before he got into to those two things. So very interesting. Since they unfortunately removed Back to Neverland as a f uh, as a film, mm -hmm. uh, they have replaced the the entire animation uh, building has been changed. You know, there's no more animators there to watch, um, uh, you know, uh, draw or animate anything, except right. some people who do color in some paint cells, which you can buy in the store. Right. Uh, they now have a pre-show that has Mushu and a cast member who is also an animator who, uh, they both describe how a film changes with uh, animation. So I did not know for sure. Have you seen this uh, new pre-show? The, uh, the Mushu thing, I, I had seen... Uh... I, I saw a video record of that, um, you know, just in, in being aware of the different projects that are, you know, that are out there that coexist with mine. Um, the, the studio has slipped me sort of behind the scenes video occasionally, and that was the one that they had shown me uh, just so I'd be aware of it. So, I, so I'm aware of what it is. Yeah. What do you think of it? Well, I you know I haven't been there in person, but it seemed like a like a fun interaction between uh, the animator and the and the character. And uh, you know I haven't I haven't been there to to see, sort of see how it plays with a live audience, but it seemed like really clever. So yeah, it's pretty um, it's pretty funny. I I think um, there's always been speculation of it, if it's actually Eddie Murphy voicing Mushu. There's always another actor who does <laughs> voices uh, as Eddie Murphy too. Um, but right. they do. Uh, but the cool thing is that they don't really need to update it because um, they have this one section where they can just play the newest Disney trailer 
and right. they don't need to change any dialogue or anything. And Mushu's mm-hmm. just upset that there's a, right. a new Disney film in in right. his place. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But the only good thing, I, like I, I do like the new pre-show, uh, mm-hmm. and it's good, and it's really nice that they play back to how Mulan was animated at the in the animation building. So it's very nice that an actual character that was animated in that building is uh is the new host you could say right. at the animation pavilion which is nice right yeah it's it's so interesting there's the there's the ancient animation building um which then everybody moved into two buildings the um the one that a lot of people call the hat building <laughs> with the <laughs> versus apprentice hat and then there were so many more staff than would fit there that there was an annex um uh, a few miles away as as well that not many people were aware of but uh so yeah they kind of spilled spilled out in um in various places but uh yeah and, and when i was a feature animator i was back in the in the first one i was back in the the walt days one um just before it was given over to executive office space um but and oh, man there was something just just a little detail but i wish i had I wish I'd thought ahead and saved it. I kind of did, but I I lost it. I, when I first went into uh, to feature animation after two years of Cal Arts, uh, Disney asked four of us to actually to become college dropouts and and jump out of the, <laughs> out of the program and come start working. So uh, Brad Bird, John Musker, me, and Doug Loeffler were all asked like if we would just uh, start working at the studio. So we all said farewell to our classmates and and leaped over there. And <laughs> the the room that I was given. I actually sat at Ollie Johnson's desk. He just he had decided to move uh, to go upstairs to. I think they were working on the second or third floor. I was on the first floor, um, and we're starting to write their wonderful books together, Frank, Frank, and Ollie. And um, so I actually was sitting at his desk, and his pencil sharpener still had shavings in it. And I'm like, oh my god, it's like magical material <laughs> it's like an amulet from the <laughs> Pixie golden dust. era yeah and so I, I i emptied it into a glass jar and just kept it on my desk and then over time i don't know what happened to it where it went and i was i went man that probably just got thrown out i'm sure it just got thrown out somebody thought it was trash but to me it was such a treasure to have like the, the last time ollie johnson like one of disney's nine old men was sharpening his pencil at that desk it's like when i sat down that's like that was the first act I did was carefully put his pencil shavings into a jar to sit next to me as inspiration. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it seems silly, but it would be so great to have them now. Oh, I wish I'd kept that. But that was in the in the original animation building. Well, did Walter, Robin, or yourself uh, get to keep any props or costumes from uh, the making of this uh, small film? Well, you know, somewhere I've got uh, uh, the shirts that uh, uh, it was a pretty cool thing that the production company arranged for us, uh, all of us on the crew uh, to get Hawaiian shirts that match Robin's. <laughs> and then, um, and then Robin and Walter and all the crew, we all like signed each other's shirts. So we have oh. these Hawaiian shirts with a zillion signatures on them. Um, so yeah, I've got mine, you know, in, uh, in, in a plastic Storage. wrap in the closet. Yeah. Where it's like <laughs> staying in good condition, but uh but there's that, and then, um, and then a you know a couple cell setups that are real that are not uh, not like commemorative or replicas that are actually uh, uh, production cells. There's a few that they said you, you know you guys can take like your favorite two or three cells, and there was a day where we were officially able to come spread things out on the table and go oh I want this one this one and this one. So we've got uh, we've got a couple original cells from it which is very cool if you were to make um this same exact film during this day and era right now um Mm -hmm. who are the who are the two people that you would go to right away if robin and walter were not available oh gosh what a question that is um i you know i'm not sure i you know uh i'm because disney would want to keep you disney would want to keep it hip and vibrant yeah times you know what i mean yeah, uh, ooh, that's that's a tough one, because I you know I was gonna say Jim Carrey and then I was gonna say, um, uh, 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 man, that's 
that's tough because the, the you know the people that are considered right on the cutting edge of um, uh, you know of the adult comedy stuff. It's it's sort of a a group of people that are a lot of them are operating pretty blue. Um, you know, I love Louis C.K. Um, think he's great, but you know that you'd have to go a whole different direction to get his sort of his sort of angst because he's sort of an angst driven comic. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I there might be a way to wrap it around that. Another fun choice might be Will Ferrell to play that role, and because I could just see him getting so scared and frustrated when he's in the spooky you know, dark version of uh, the ship. And then when he's faced with Captain Hook, I could, I could totally picture Will Ferrell, uh, you know, just having a field day with trying to argue with Captain Hook and stuff. So did you see him dress up as one of the uh, hitchhiking ghosts in uh, haunted mansion? They had like no, a stream no. portrait thing. It's amazing. Him, <laughs> <laughs> him, Jack Black and Jason Siegel. I think, um, Will Ferrell is the, um, the, uh, he's the taller guy. He's the the taller skeleton one. <laughs> well, well, it, yeah, well, see now, wouldn't that be a fun idea? Is to take uh, the the three of them into uh, you know into the film at the same time instead of taking one person in, take the team in. Hey, you know, you were talking about the uh, the after the the film played, and you would go into the hallway and look through the glass and see what was happening. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there was a lot happening. Sometimes there was very little happening. Sometimes there was stuff happening, but they were pushed way against the far wall so you couldn't see because there were some very shy people uh, sometimes. Or secret things happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, well, I think it was more shyness than secret. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was interesting because we did something that usually Disney keeps very secret, but we did absolutely under the tourist nose every day. All, all our guests saw the inner sanctum of what we were doing uh, as as soon as we installed Back to Neverland, mm-hmm. we uh, actually the, you know we had the opening day, and then they asked me to to work on two other things immediately. That were one of them was in in the park, uh, the stunt show, and um, and then to come up with the uh, the cranium command uh, to to rewrite and direct that and. It, it was two shows that were in trouble, and so Lucas had sort of glaringly not opened the stunt show on opening day of Disney MGM Studios, and we, and, you know, uh, and I had four shows that were opening that day, wow. and you know, Back to Neverland being the first one that I had started, and and one of them had been to go uh, film George Lucas in uh, in a short with George Lucas and Anthony Daniels uh, about editing in film and so I had been up at the ranch had shot him and and had posted actually did some of the post on Back to Neverland up at the Lucas Ranch while I was posting his project and so he'd, he you know he'd see me at work and was used to to the whole milieu you know and um, so but he just didn't think that the stunt show was really like it, yes, it had the big spectacle. There were a lot of built-in big spectacle things, but he just didn't like the way it unfolded as showmanship and story and spectacle. He just so uh, and I was unaware of this, but it, but I just saw that it was they were doing maybe two audiences a day, but it was not really considered fully open, and they didn't sort of celebrate it like they did the other things at the opening day of the park. And so opening nights. Uh, there was uh, we were on a, a boat that was going around the the little lagoon there at, at Disney World and and Eisner and Katzberg and Lucas were standing together and they gestured me over and Lucas says I want you to go fix the stunt show and I'm like well what and I have never seen the stunt show and he's like <laughs> look he said it needs story it needs showmanship and you know how to do that stuff so just you know that's what it needs I don't care that you don't know about stunts or whatever it needs story it needs showmanship so um, so I you know and Eisner and Katzenberg are lying nodding their heads yes yes go do this for George like okay so um, I was flattered to ask but I thought wow this is going to be interesting this is I has you know, I'm certainly have never worked with stunt people. So, but by my point through all this sidebar discussion is, so after the opening of Back to Neverland, where you walk through the corridor and you see these windows, right? Yes. And it was an empty building. So we're like, okay, uh, I'm stuck in Florida working on the stunt show because that's where it is. And I, at the same time, have to 
figure out a whole new story and plan for Cranium Command, which is going to be in Epcot. Uh, so I have to bring all my team to Florida with me to work with me. Uh, where should I put them? Oh, I'll put them in the fishbowl. It's like when you come out of Back to Neverland, you're going to see my crew writing and developing Cranium Command, which is going to be in Epcot. So when people came out of the Back to Neverland film and looked through the glass, they were seeing storyboards for for uh, Cranium Command. So they were watching an, another attraction being planned right before their very eyes. So if anybody has photographs or or video or whatever from back in those days, if they take a close look, they'll see the birth of Cranium Command happening on those storyboards. The only video that I've really seen is there's a Full House episode where they come in 94, and mm -hmm. they're working on uh, other characters, nothing on Cranium Command, which right. is interesting too. But um, right. that it's really hard to find footage during that time. And I, I actually just found a video right before we started the interview, and I, I think I sent it to you. And Yeah, and that was did, much nicer. Which makes me know um, we definitely want to have you back on the show again. Um, Cranium Command is very interesting. That's another one of your projects because you've done so many besides Back to the, Fu back to, back to the Future. <laughs> I am losing it now it's since, all right <laughs> since back to neverland so um thank you so much for coming on our show i actually have one little fun game i have left over it's um would would you rather this or that so for instance okay. if i said I'd mickey rather, mouse I'd this. <laughs> <laughs> i'm done i'd rather this <laughs> <laughs> so for instance if i said if you'd rather mickey mouse or Minnie mouse you would say whatever you whatever which one you prefer the two so for me, it would be Mickey, right. Mouse, Mickey Mouse. So, um, oh, gosh. <laughs> so well, he, I I had the pleasure of working with Wayne Allwine for on, uh, oh yes, the, the voice, voice of Mickey. Mickey for so many years, and uh, he's uh, he's you know he's gone now. But I also and and he but he was a dear friend, and um, I also got to debut his um, his voice replacement. It was a young storyboard artist from. Kansas, I think, who did the voice of Mickey for me in Animation Magic recently. And so I got to work with the Mickey, who was there for so many years, and Wayne was wonderful. And then as the new guy came in and was trying his wings, um, he got to be Mickey. So if you go to Animation Magic, when Mickey appears, that's one of the earliest recordings of uh, of the new Mickey, and he did a he did a wonderful job too. So, sidebar. I, I know you have this and the this or that waiting, but I just I got stuck with your example. Oh, I love sidebars. They're the best. Yes. We we should title these segments sidebars with Jerry Rees. Multiple sidebars. <laughs> Multiple sidebars. Like, in fact, where's the point? It's all sidebar. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life. I am a sidebar, and I talk about sidebars all the time. So That's right. <laughs> That's where I prefer to live. You get run over if you're in the <laughs> middle of the road. I'd rather be on the sidebar. Exactly. So here are your four uh, this or that. Call, it's called. Oh my gosh. Of, I know. Are you, you ready? Do you are have you... a drum roll? Do you uh, have a drum roll? My um, heart's beating. I can make one. <laughs> That's a oh, class. that's good. good. <laughs> it's the best I can do right now. But here we go. So ready? Okay. <gasps> <laughs> Neverland or Disneyland? Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, you know. Uh, you thought these weren't going to be hard. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that is, they're, they're so folded into each other in like the wormhole of the universe where you can go to Disneyland and enter Neverland. And while well, told us the story of Neverland before he built Disneyland and I feel like they're so I, I step through one and I'm in the, the, the universal wormhole just zaps me to the other one so I, I'm not sure they're separable but um, I would uh, I, I would have to say for for pure fantasy I love original place uh, Neverland but um, for inviting other people to join in fantasy uh, which I've gotten to do 16 times now. Uh, it's Disneyland because that's where I am able to make portals to fantasy for everyone to step into. So nice I, loophole I'm there. Sorry, sorry that I had to see. I did like a little a, uh, a, loophole. a caveat, a loophole, <laughs> but I'm calling it the wormhole because remember, well, after he made after he made uh, Peter Pan. And then he did the first immersive experience way before video games where he said, come to my park and you've already seen the movie, step into the boat and fly into Neverland on this boat. And uh, so that was that was actually was the first immersive 
uh, version of movies before video games ever existed. So, mm-hmm. so, so, see, there was, and it was just a continuous thing. Then you'd, you'd be like, well, I went to Disneyland and I'm back in Neverland. So, excuse me, it, it coexists in one continuum. So, there you <laughs> Okay, you ready? Here we go. Another uh, oh. Neverland type of question Cap- uh. Captain Hook or Peter Pan? Oh, um, I'm going to say Peter Pan just because uh, I, I love seeing him tease Captain Hook. And I, I am <laughs> totally entertained by Captain Hook. But, uh, you know, I got to go with the hero and the flawed hero. <laughs> and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go Peter Pan. Tinkerbell or Wendy? I'm a Tinkerbell guy. <laughs> I'll, you know, Wendy did not have pixie dust. I'm sorry. It's just uh, Tinkerbell is so much a part of the whole magical Disney experience ever since that she, her contribution, I must say, was went way beyond her role in Peter Pan. So. And now kids can meet her in the parks, which is a great thing, too, because they see uh, the new CGI animated movies of Tinkerbell. So. That's right. And, you know, it, it was interesting. Here's a little sidebar, which we'll, in a future show, maybe we'll cover, but just a quick little sidebar. In Mystic Manor, uh, I directed the uh, media for Mystic Manor. Um, and one of our things was the enchantment gone wild, which started out sort of the early drafts being pixie dust. And I'm like, oh, this is not the same kind of thing. It's edgy. It's like Danny Elfman did the music. It's kind of impish. It gets, goes nuts. So our challenge was to take uh, that little look of pixie dust and really change its behavior and patterns so that you don't think Tinkerbell. You think a different force is uh, manipulating the pixie dust. But that's a conversation for another day. But it's... Um, a sidebar that does make a little bit of sense based on your question. Brought to you by Jerry <laughs> Rees. <laughs> brought, brought to you by the Tierra Talk Show. So there you go. <laughs> okay, here we go. This one, I think I know the answer you're going to give. Traditional animation or CGI animation? Um, You don't know the answer I'm going to give. Uh, oh, 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 okay. It is this, that that the, that the, the, the notion that there are uh, significant distinctions I feel is false. And I think that uh, performance can come through stop motion, traditional, CG, and whatever else we devise in the future, holographic, that all of those tools um, either are horrible or wonderful in different people's hands. So Mm -hmm. traditional animation can suck. Or traditional animation can be amazing and memorable. Um, and it's not just a matter of production value and cost. I mean, you look at Dumbo with a rushed out little traditional film and it's charming as hell. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, CG can be horrid or it can be wonderful. So to me, it's, it's storytellers using all these different tools. Um, and, I, and I, in fact, have a, a, a whole bunch of stuff in various stages of development. And I actually have a stop motion feature. I have a traditional animation feature. I have a CG feature. I have a completely live action feature. And then I have combination, um, live action, CG, and puppetry uh, combined. And to me, just s- storytelling and performance is the key. And as long as you do that, all the mediums are absolutely legit, and if you don't do it, none of them are worth crap. So, way back when I was in uh, high school, uh, the 70s, I took Fortran computer language while I was doing music and fine art and creative writing. I took Fortran computer language, mm-hmm. and then I, yes, I was. Uh, mentored under Eric Larson while I was still in high school before the CalArts uh, program started. And then it was teacher's assistant, came and did traditional animation. But between films, when Tron came through, I was the only guy, and Bill Corey reminded me of this at the Tron uh, anniversary recently, but he was pointing out to the crowd at the Chinese theater, it's like, we put out an invite to animators to join us. The only guy from the Disney group that joined us was Jerry. So I jumped onto computer animation way back then. Um, I actually had devised a computer-oriented production system, 81, 82, before even the Wild Things test happened at Disney. And Gary Kurtz, who had just done Empire Strikes Back, and Brad Bird, who we were together we were planning to do a feature. And we wanted to have it be the first feature to really um, to really focus around humans 
and be wonderful and not terrible. And we said, yes, you can do amazing human-oriented animation. It doesn't have to be rotoscope. It doesn't have to be terrible. It can be wonderful Disney tradition, but contemporary feel. And years later, when Brad did uh, The Incredibles, I went, ah, bingo, that's that's the style we were pushing in the early 80s. Um, but so so I was on the bandwagon, and in those days, people were like, why are you interested in computers? It's going to be push button art. And they went, no, it's it's a tool in your hand. And then I was like one of the first guys in my circle of friends to get like the power PC and the Wacom drawing tablet. And I was taking stuff that I would draw that they would swear it was like pencil and watercolor, but I'd done it on a Wacom tablet. Um, and so I st- started to convince some people they're like, Oh, you did that on the computer. It's like, yes, it is your tool. It doesn't do the art for you. So I've been, Mr. Uh, Next Gen, and in fact, two shows ago, uh, a project I took into Disney just won Most Innovative Use of Technology Award, uh, Thea, uh, Thea Award for Disney, and the one I'm doing now for Epcot, I can, mums the word about what it is, but it, is, it has so much of traditional thinking and Next Gen just, just totally embedded in it, and it's, it's the most brave venture that uh, I've ever seen Disney do, and I, I'm so looking forward to it opening in 2015, but um, but as long as it's I, not Phineas and Ferb replacing Figment, no, I think no, we're but okay. I, <laughs> but I actually was was actually one of the first people. Um, like I said, I was the I was the only guy to jump out of the feature animation group and join the computer animation effort on Tron. So uh, so I've actually you know a lot of people know me for the traditional stuff because my storytelling attitude is very rooted in the traditional stuff but but uh i was you know one of the first people to to fully embrace uh that cg was going to accomplish true character animation in the disney tradition and, um i was t- tooting that horn like in you know <laughs> 80, 81 um and then it got there and i must say i just really thought that w- that once brad uh bird was with the team at pixar um, for Ratatouille, it's like a lot of people had said, well, yes, CG is getting really far and it's doing a really cute performance, but it's still kind of, it's a little bit predictable. It's a little bit like it's auto in betweening and stuff. It's still not as custom as if you fl- like a flip a scene from Pinocchio and stuff, which we, we used to do. We actually used to have permission to, they would bring original stacks of art uh, from all that stuff and leave it in our room for a week and we'd flip through and look at the not copies the original stacks of animation art from Milt Call and Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson yeah. and were and Mark Davis and uh, and it was just stunning stuff but you you would look at the nuance of that and you'd go like that is so organic and living and it's not like it's not automated like between poses it's this is organic and people went okay you were right. It's like the performance happened, the storytelling happened with CG, but it can't really achieve that degree of nuance where you like have fun looking frame by frame like when you flip the drawings. And I felt like when Brad hooked up with Pixar and he pushed him to do some, you know, some new things where he could draw action lines and things like right on top of the CG characters on the screen and then they could go back and warp and bend things and uh, and uh, there's things, there's scenes where you can look at Ratatouille and do frame by frame of some of that stuff, and it's the same pleasurable like nuance that that came from looking at those classic Disney iconic traditional animation scenes. And uh, so you know, it 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 got there. And now there's whole Brave New Worlds where it's it's going next. And and again, there's like some people dragging their feet or worried about it. And I just you know, look performance storytelling is the key and as long as that's your guide like all these tools are legit and um and that's what the one thing that's been so cool and it's so interesting talking to you and uh and people like you who've really focused on the theme park stuff because frankly we're able to do a lot of experimenting um in the theme park area in ways that that don't happen in the features until later. So like, for instance, doing Robin, like testing that out. How does an audience feel about Robin Williams and doing the morph thing? And, and once they were like, oh, the audience loves it. Okay, now let's put him in Aladdin. Um, there's a lot of other things uh, like Cranium Command was the, it was the first time, I think it was the first time ever that there were 
and I, it could be wrong because I haven't done the global search, but um, certainly the first one that we were all aware of where there were 10 discrete tracks of sound that you could mix in a theater. Um, and you, so you could fly sound to 10 discrete points in the, in the room and that all came off. They, they weren't encoded. They were on separate tracks running simultaneously as one theater experience. Uh, the, you know, the, the project for, that I did for, the, for Animation Magic, that was uh, that they, they took a concept that I brought in and they, they did this proprietary software to scale it up to work for, where my demo worked for a couple people at a time. They had to scale it up to work for 700 people at a time. And uh, so it broke new ground. And the, the thing that we're doing for 2015, we're, we're anticipating that it'll, it'll be a, a really involving wonderful experience for people to participate in not just look at like to actually so. take part in and and to be so forward thinking in its technology but so uh fundamental in its creativity that it will play for a decade easily but it's so that kind of ex- r&d experimentation where you go well, let, let's try something let's make the first time it's ever happened like this um, you know, when, when I did Cinemagique, it was like, okay, there, it isn't normal for a giant movie screen to rip and have a physical sword impale in the stage and have an actor <laughs> walk out of the movie. You're like, okay, well, but we're going to do it. And, and so doing that sort of pioneering stuff where everybody on the team is pushing towards the first time their department has ever done whatever it is, um, is just wonderful. And it's, and so, you know, the, the, to know that there are groups of people who are particularly interested in the work that lives in the theme parks, which is actually quite adventurous and experimental, um, it's just sort of it's sort of delightful for all of us who who do it because it's it's very much sort of behind the scenes, you know, and not uh, noticed enough. But I know, think that's amazing that th- this new project that you're working on is going to be more interactive because that was the whole purpose of a. Uh, of Disney's MGM Studios, which is now known as Disney's Hollywood Studios. Right. Um, people would be able to see things being filmed. Now right. the backup right. tour rumors are that it's going to be uh, torn down. Cars Land or Star Wars Land is going to be replaced. You know, the whole theme of that park was to see the behind the scenes of right. what animators like yourself and other people do. And that that's just really disappointing. But this, this right. sounds like a very interesting project. And I hope that we hear more about it next year, 2014, so we can get prepped and excited for it. Because all big Disney fans like myself are excited for new, interactive, and and things like that. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, obviously we're going to keep a lot of stuff under wraps as far as particulars. But I understand. but (laughs) But I can, but I would just say that arguably it will be, you know, I think for me, and for the guests, probably the most just fundamentally creative space to experience together that I've ever done. So, um, that and, 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 and not just, and, and not just, and not just for me to say, okay, now the ship has sailed, watch it happen. I mean, if I go, if I go to it with you, it will be like, let's say we go in together. It's not like, oh, for you, it's a brand new experience. And for me, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I saw that coming. I'm like, um, you know, we, we built this whole thing. And it's like, I will be just as creative in the moment as you, even being one of the makers of the project when I step into it with you. So it's just going to be so much about the blooming of our Oh, you're getting me so together. excited so, about this now. I mean, it's, it's very, I mean, I, 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 I won't go into any particulars, but just to say that, that Disney is is has set a bar of like how can we really blow your mind make creativity and imagination be the engine for our experience is uh, it's just they've, they're leaping further than ever before so I'm very happy. Although I just wanted to add one more thing, I was checking to make sure they they have handprints of um, Mark Davis, Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnson, Ward Kimball, and Ken O'Connor outside mm-hmm. of the animation studio. They're still there, very worn though because of the rain and everything. And right, people right. don't notice them because they're in this right hand corner and they're just going right into the theater. So um, only people who know about know about the handprints usually go over there which is really right. sad because you know these men i think all of them have passed away at this point i don't know ken o'connor passed away 
maybe? Uh, I, I believe know. so. Yes, I believe still, so. Third yeah, handprints was, are still there. It was great getting to work with him a couple of times, like on The Brave Little Toaster and on uh, Back to Neverland. It was just a treat. And he, he was so not in retirement. He wasn't at the studio, but he had the most percolating home studio you ever saw. And he, he, he just relished being asked to use his expertise again. So uh, we, we were just delighted to have him. But I have one more uh, this or that for you. Uh oh! Oh, We weren't done with that. No, no. Five times. That. (laughs) Okay, one more to go. Here we go. All right. You can fly, or when you wish upon a star. Um. Uh, when you wish upon a star, just it's deeper for me. I mean, when you when you can fly is a rush of an experience, but when you wish is like it's everything. Can you give us a note and, 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 and when when you wish when you wish upon a star like to me the the the, the idea behind that is is when you wish you could wish for flight or you could wish for anything you could wish for just a myriad of things so to me when you wish upon a star is just so much more fundamental in its in its reaching for a dream um but it, you know you, you can fly as a specific expression but i would say like look when i when i wish upon a star one of my wishes is that i could fly so i've got both covered <laughs> Loophole again, but can you can you play uh, can you do a little Robin impersonation of singing the song? <laughs> oh, that would be that would be insane. <laughs> Let me see. Well, uh, well, you should do more of a Cliff Edwards, like when you wish upon a star. I don't know. That's very well, good. Tammy, you you're just asking too much of me. <laughs> you should be a singer, Jerry. You need the, for this 2015 no project. You need to sing. <laughs> for the 2015 project and put it in there somehow. <laughs> you can fly, you can fly. You like Cronkite doing it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Still flying away to Neverland, though. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I love all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, when you ask the question, you think about it deeper. Um, um, I also love uh, uh, Dream is uh, Wish Your Heart Makes. Um, oh, me too. You know that that to me is so precious, and, and you know the um, the you know the the film that played at the very end. It was sort of the clip show emotional moments that played at the end of that tour that started with Back to Neverland. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember they, they they were sort of the editor was working on that and asked my opinion of different songs, and uh, to, I said to me that said, no matter how your heart is grieving, if you keep on believing the dream that you wish will come true was like such a beautiful lyric. So, uh, so they went with that and, uh, but yeah, there was just some brilliant things expressed in those lyrics and, uh, yeah, you know, I love you can fly, but, uh, when you wish upon a star is that hits go, home. goes deeper for me. Mm-hmm. So, well, thank you so much for, for being in our first episode, Jerry, that it's so exciting. And I know many people are going to want to check out your website, which has plenty of, of behind-the-scenes photos of Back to Neverland. So you can head to the website at www.jerryreese.com. That's right. And uh, check out that. And also in the comments below, if you have any other questions you'd like to ask Jerry, because I know for sure, um, I hope – for sure that Jerry will come back on and and we'll discuss more of his projects hopefully going in order uh because back to Neverland was your first um project as an attract for attraction wise um and there were and there were 16 and now I'm working on uh 17 and yeah. and overlapping start of 18 so we'll see so if you have any other questions just comment below um i will post several links to uh several different video clips of um back to neverland so you can see the difference between the um the cell painting and the computer version of that because they're both updated at different times and um now and this I, is on youtube right this will be on youtube this interview so will be on so YouTube. in that, so, so even though are, we're doing audio only you you got to put something in that window so are you gonna oh yes so, so are you gonna put like yourself as windy and me as tinkerbell or is <laughs> you gonna do some kind of image <laughs> <laughs> or maybe tink- hopefully a little lost boy i don't know you as tinkerbell <laughs> Well, I just I know you're probably up to no good. I yes, I would <laughs> I would probably do that. No. So okay, so I need to apologize for the the website is not quite up to date that um oh, pitch Mystic class. Manor needs to go in there now and um um <laughs> and and that used to be called the Mystery Attraction and now there is actually a Mystery Attraction which is the 2015 one I'm talking about. But um <laughs> but yeah, um 
and also I had been very sort of uh, careful about not putting any imagery from the show itself for and um animation magic that's on the cruise ships but now there's everybody is posting youtubes and things and personal pictures yes. all over the place so it's a social i can media certainly world. <laughs> uh, put it i can now i i can put it on my website so there's some updating i need to do it i've just so, been so crazy i haven't gotten to it yet so apologies for it not being entirely up to date and the last thing is occasionally if people write to me on the website for some reason some of those messages i have found have gone to uh, spam. So I occasionally dig through spam. So occasionally it can get lost. So if I don't respond, um, it's either uh, that it got lost in the spam folder or that I've just been insanely busy. But I too, do try to get to everything eventually. So. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jerry. I think we need to fly ourselves back to Neverland at this point. <laughs> okay, because we've been, uh, we've been on the sidebar lane for a while now. That's so. right. <laughs> well, so we will... Uh, so we the pixie will, dust will shower over us and we will fly. We will fly to, to Neverland. So here we go. Mm-hmm. And then I'll put the audio <laughs> in for, I'm a, pop, I'm a corporate symbol. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. I'm a corporate symbol.